All right, welcome back to CS4510 Lecture 14B. This is the last lecture on the unit of computability theory. It's also a very fascinating one. It's called uh, Kolmogorov Complexity. It sounds really advanced and scary and cool, but it's actually very, relatively simple. Kolmogorov was this famous Soviet mathematician. S solved many problems. Have you, have you ever heard of Kolmogorov? Have you ever heard the name Kolmogorov? He, he discovered, he discovered, invented the axioms for probability theory. Solved, he solved many mm, important problems. Uh, whatever the Soviets were interested at the time, it's, it's kind of fascinating. The, they were they had a very different interest in the problems uh, in, in, what, in what problems they considered important than we did. Um, he was also uh, gay. He lived in a one bedroom apartment on the river with his other mathematician husband uh, Alexandrov, and you know they were on the, their little cottage and whatever. And there was some famous story about. Some blackmail thing with Stalin. I think there's a film about it. I'm not exactly sure. Very famous guy. Uh, solved a lot of things. Uh, uh, very interesting. Um, the topic of today itself, Kolmogorov complexity, was independently discovered by many people. And uh, Kolmogorov, though, had the best tr treatment of it. He did the best job. So we just call it Kolmogorov complexity. It's also by Solmanov and Chaitin and even uh, before them. It's a very simple idea. So basically, in its purest essence, it's nothing except a theory of description. So consider the following two strings, right? Let me just left. Let me just make sure that I don't introduce any variables. Let's just get rid of that one, I guess. Which one? Uh, so these are two strings. Which one is more complicated? The right one. Why? It, it, it has two kinds of alphabets. Yes. So, uh, to explain, so uh, description is a uh, syntactical representation of some other object. And the easier something to describe, the shorter description it should have. So, if I were to explain these two strings to someone, this one is easy to describe to someone because there's, I really just have to describe the length. I just say eight ones. This one, the information in the description which describes a string inherently, explicitly has to contain information about the location of the zeros. So I could say eight one, and then and the zeros there twice. Uh, also, totally an accident. This string is like a WW, right? One one zero one. Uh, I could say one one zero one twice. That would be a shorter description than the string itself. Um, turns out we can. We can build a theory of description entirely on computability from Turing machines that we've done so far. We can, we can give a very good explanation about why, s we have an intuitive notion about why some strings are easy, quote unquote, to describe, and some strings are hard, quote unquote, to describe. Well, we can just do that as a, a measure of complexity. So before we begin, a measure is a function from like uh, things, Uh, N or uh, R, something like this, right? Where, where um, if you have two values, the measure like mu of x greater than mu of y means intuitively x has more of the thing than y does, right? So you can compare two objects. So like mu of zero mu of x is equal to zero if like x is nothing or empty or whatever, right? Some sort of base case object. Um, what are some examples of measure? Volume, area. Uh, that's the only two examples I can come up with. Weight. Weight, yes. Mass is a measure, right? If, if an object has zero mass, it's nothing, right? Um, it turns out we're going to be able to con construct a measure on the descriptive complexity of a string. So it'll take in a string, and it's going to output a number. And the bigger the number, the more complicated the string is to describe. Now, that's what we would want to build. We would want to build such a measure on strings, where we can describe the, 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 the algorithmic complexity of it, like how hard it is to describe its descriptive uh, ability. Turns out we can do that quite easily. Um, so by using uh, what we know about computability theory, we're going to say k of x. Uh, for all 
uh, x, which is a string, we define k of x to be uh, the length of the shortest program to print x and halt. So in some sense, what is a program that prints a string? A program really is nothing more than a description of a string. So we can start by looking at, to discuss how simple or complicated a string is, or how the explanations, the many explanations of a string are, we may simply look at the shortest program to print such a string. If I were to write this in words, I would write k of x is equal to min uh, p is a program in the set of all programs, uh, such that uh, the length of, uh, we're minimizing over p, um, such that the universal simulator given the program and runs it with no input, outputs x. So here, this is, this is the, the, the full description of, of the machine. k of x is the measure function. We're looking for the smallest program, p, in the set of all programs, when we're minimizing with respect to the length of the program. U is a universal simulator. It takes on the program and the input. In this case, it runs the machine on nothing. It's not conditional. It runs the program. The program takes no input. It has to print the string. So somehow in the machine itself is the description of the string X, and it has to be able to compute and produce this string X. It outputs X. So P prints X with no help. This is the definition of uh, Kolmogorov complexity. Now, why did I say program, and why did I not say Turing machine? Um, it turns out that the Kolmogorov, like, like Turing completeness, uh, although some things are certainly easier to implement in one program versus another, Kolmogorov complexity of a string doesn't really matter uh, with respect to the program that you use to implement it. So this is called the invariance theorem. Let's prove it. Let's suppose it does matter. So consider two variants of the function, uh, of the measure. So we'll consider uh, a Python-specific implementation of Kolmogorov complexity and a Rust-specific implementation of uh, Kolmogorov complexity, right? So some things may be easier or harder to do in uh, one program versus another, but, not, but only a constant harder. What's basically what we're going to prove. Not like asymptotically harder, like the length of an algorithm is not going to be quadratically more than uh, something else in one language versus another. So suppose, um, let, uh, what do I call this? Let a pi prod be the shortest uh, Python program. Uh, to build, to print, to print X. So there is, suppose there is a, sh a shortest Python program to print X. We give a Rust program to print X as follows. Right. Um, and I'm not exactly the best Rust programmer, but I chose this one, I think, because it was weird. Fn interpret. Anything about Rust? No, I like Haskell though. That is a functional programming language. You would probably love lambdas. Yes. Lambda calculus. Maybe I should have done lambda would actually have been a better example because that would show something about lambda calculus Turing completeness. Basically, the idea is like if a program is Turing complete. Suppose we know Python is Turing complete. We know Rust is Turing complete. You can write a Rust simulator in Python and a Python simulator in Rust. So we're going to have an, a Rust function here called interpret, which takes on input Python code and runs it, right? So I have this like this. Uh, now what does a Python program look like?
right? So this string, this string in the Rust program is somehow a Python program, right? New lines and all. And then I'm just going to call interpret uh, pyprog. So this is a Python program. Excuse me. This is a Rust program to print uh, a Python to print X. Okay. X is printable by this string called pyprog. Pyprog is a Python program to print the string, right? So we know that the size of pyprog is equal. We uh, we said it's a small, so we'll say it's we'll say it's k of x, right? Um, what is the size of this? Pro what is the size? Excuse me, pi here, k pi of x. What is the size of this Rust program? Well, so like, if you want to show an upper or lower bound on Kolmogorov complexity, to show an upper bound, all you have to do is give a program for it. So we want to show an upper bound of the possible Rust programs, which are capable of printing string x, right? The, the, this program, what is the size of this program as a function of the of the x, right? So we measure algorithms, we measure the, the runtime as a function of the input. Here, let's measure it as a function of x, of length of x even, right? Uh, so what is the size of this program to print? Uh, this, what is the size of this Rust program to print uh, X? This is certainly a program which prints X because it simulates the Python program. Well, it's first off going to be the size of PyProg. PyProg is contained within the thing. So it's going to contain... Uh, Shouldn't the equality be flipped? No. But it contains the Python program. Ah. We'll, we'll, oh, okay. let's, let's, we'll, we'll get there. Okay, right. So um, it contains the Python program, but it also contains the interpreter. How big is the interpreter in the size of the input x? So, not the input, but in the size of x, how big is the interpreter? It's a trick question here. It's interpreting the Python code? It's interpreting the Python code. The size of... Python I've never been wrong. asked that before. I've never, it's a trick question because uh, it's independent, right? So like right. the C compiler is not, a, the size of the C compiler is not at all a function of the size of the programs you can give the C compiler. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, it's a constant. Right. So we're going to say this is, I'm going to type pi and what did I call this? Be sure, pi and rest. This is just some constant C. Okay, we're going to call it C. It's independent of the size of the string x. k of x is not independent of x. Okay? k of x is dependent on x, but the interpreter it must interpret any valid program. So it, maybe it's long, probably Python is probably pretty long as a code, but you can just put it as one big function there, fine. This is a lab. Now we've written a Python interpreter in Rust. Seems useful. Python is also Turing complete, so you can write a Rust compiler in Python. Why you would want to do that, I don't know, but it's possible. No one would ever doubt you that it's possible. We can redo the same thing. We will hard code a Python, excuse me, a Rust program, a different Rust program in Python. We can derive the same inequality with the languages flipped. They're both Turing complete, why not? So we get a lower bound on the size of the smallest Python program has to be uh, smaller than, that Rust, than the, pro, the Python program which simulates the Rust program plus the size of, uh, it wouldn't be a Rust interpreter in Python, but now a Rust compiler. Distinction is arbitrary, of course, doesn't really matter. And the size of the Rust interpreter we, written, we wrote in Python would also be uh, constant size, right? So we have these two inequalities. If we have A less than B plus O1, and we have B is less than A plus O1, we know that A and B are within a constant of each other. So the way we would write that mathematically, A minus B is less than or equal to O of 1, right? So what that means is that K of Rust and K of Pi similarly are asymptotically that close. Less than some constant C. Right. But this was not really dependent on the fact that Rust and Python did anything. This was just, this was kind of independent of 
uh, what we could do for Rust or Python, right? You could do C or Go or whatever, Haskell, you know? So for any two Turing complete languages you could make, uh, the, the, the difference between them and a different language is that most are constant. And we want to study the asymptotic, so it doesn't matter about the, the program we choose. So instead of saying specifically Turing machines, even, we could even do Turing machines as one. I'm just going to say programs, generically programs, and then that's sufficient for us to prove the invariance theorem. The, the measure, and here's our first beautiful result. Algorithmic complexity of a string is independent of the language you formalize, if you describe it in. That makes sense, because the way you may describe something in English, probably the complexity of the string is independent of the fact that you're describing it in English. Describe it in Filipino or whatever. You know, it's probably going to be as complicated or not as complicated, depending on the language that you use, you know? Uh, it's kind of real a measured connection to like the church Turing thesis. We're not only any, anything possible in one language is possible in others, but the size of the programs doesn't differ by more than a constant, right? The size is the smallest programs, I should say. All right, now let's do some examples. It's like much easier than proving variance. So, what is a program, if I give, I want a program to print str x, string x. What is a program that prints string x? For any string x. Print x? Yes, exactly. So, uh, I want a program to print uh, the string x. Uh, def, f, uh, x takes on, uh, print x. Okay. That's it. So basically, the, the, the words here that we should say to describe this is that we hard-coded the string x into the program. Program takes no input, outputs the string. Fine. What is the size of this program? The size of x plus a constant. Exactly. So we can say that the size of the smallest program is less than or equal to the size of this program. We have shown in one program. We don't know if a smaller one exists. We do know a bigger one isn't the smallest, though, because this one is at least this big, right? So we'll say the size of x plus some constant c. Fine. And that's actually a general upper bound. The size, the, here's, a, here's the deeper mark here. We're talking about programs, but again, it's a theory of description. If the, you can always describe a string by saying it. Okay? Just say the description. I erased it already, but ones and zeros. Just say the description of the string. That is certainly always a description. Um... What about k of xx? x concatenated with itself. Here's a bad idea. Uh, def f xx takes on, and it would be a string that's now twice as long. So you could hard code xx. That would be uh, allowed. But then the size of this program, you would get that the size of k of xx is less than or equal to the size of xx, which is just 2x, right? Plus c, size of constant. Again, the constants don't matter, right? Here, uh, but instead, this is a bad way of doing it. There's a shorter way. There's a smaller program to print xx. What is it? Print 2 times x. Yes. So that program is going to look like this. Def f x takes on print x plus x. Right? Look how x, I drew a shorter line, that means it's a shorter code. <laughs> so, the, this, this, what is the upper bound here? It's k of x, x is less than equal, what's stored? x is stored, x plus, and this constant, I'm going to call it c prime, because it's slightly different. Right? So, we basically half the size of the program by computing xx from x. We didn't need to store all of xx. There was redundant information in there. Repetition is redundant. We can simply store the part, one copy of something, if we have, redu if we have repetition, and then describe a way to compute the whole thing back. So here's the difference. Before we were just storing the string and then restoring the string. Now we can compute the string from some other smaller stored pieces. Now I will say, I call this c prime instead of c because this c actually is slightly bigger by like two bytes. There has to be those two symbols there, right? So the constant, it's still in general, it's still a constant, it doesn't matter. But not all constants are the same. Here, this constant is slightly larger. It's, it's true only on a technicality that c prime is greater than or equal to c. I guess strictly greater. 
Uh, and we don't really care about that, but it's worth mentioning one time. The constants ch may change because uh, it measures, you know, what is the size it takes to compute something. But it doesn't, um, constant is constant. As long as it's not a function of x, we don't really care. One more quick uh, thing here is this has nothing to do with the time it takes to compute at all. It's totally just the algorithmic size. Totally, totally, totally about size. Nothing to do even a little bit with uh, time, you know. So as long as the program prints it at all, we're, we're good. The fact that it took an extra step of computation, you know, that's just, the, that's just what it is. Okay, I'm going to give you one, and let's see if you can generalize here. Rho k of x to the n, so n copies of x. Write a function? Yeah, what, write a function, write a small function that prints it. Print x. N x to the n, yeah, yeah. So just print n times x? Yes, but what is the size of that program? Um, nx plus c. Oh no, so it's just x. So let's do the program, right? I got confused. Def, f, it's going to have stored x, right? Right. But here's the tricker, uh, the kicker. It's also going to have stored n. Oh, n could be right. a trillion. Right. It's a function, not, it can't be a function of only x now. It has to be a function of n. Uh, it's going to print, uh, what do I say? Uh, it doesn't really matter for i in, it's constant. For i in range n, c out, x, right? So it's mixing Python and C there. Um, what is the size of this program, though? Size of x plus size of n plus c. Yes. What is the size of x? What is the size of n? So x is a string. The size of the string is the length of the string. n is a number. What is the size of the number? How many bits does it take to represent a number? Have to be less than or equal to x? Well, so x and n could be independent. x could be one bit, one could be one letter, and n could be a billion. Right. x could be a billion long, and n could be two. So they're independent. Um, n, though, I mean, it's, it's kind of arbitrary. The size of n. Right. I could write it like this, but the thing is, just as a small type error, the size of n is just the length, the number of bits it takes to represent n, which is log n. Oh, okay, All right. Right, so the difference between a string and a number is totally arbitrary, it's totally made up, but the size of x is, a, is as a string length, and the size of n is log n. If you convert it into a number, and then you took the size of it, it would be log x, right? And that doesn't really matter, made up. We can actually do a shorter program, okay? Uh, let uh, g be shortest program to print x. Instead of storing x, we can compute x from the shortest program. Instead of storing x, we're going to take it from g. So, if there is a smaller program to print x, we can actually uh, save a little bit of space that way. Instead of the size of x, we're going to replace this with the size of x, uh, with k of x, plus log n. Right? We can, even, we, we can even do the same thing with n, okay? We stored n, convert n to a program which returns a smaller description of n than n itself, if it exists. This g might just be, it might, it, could, it might only be that it stores x, but it might be shorter, right? If in the case, only in the case that it's shorter, do we have a better upper bound here? Because this might be smaller than the length of x. So if it is smaller than the length of x, then we have a better upper bound. If it's not smaller, we don't have a better upper bound, but fine. But the, the upper bound is still better, right? 
Okay. Uh, what about for any computable function f? What is k of f of x? f is a computable function, so there exists a Turing machine or a program or whatever. It computes x for us. What is k of f of x? And again, as a function of what? Let's say as a function of x. So are you trying to upper bound in size or define the function? Any function. Right. So it's less than equal to f of x plus log n, let's see. Or rather... Sure, but f is a program. x is a string. You recall the program takes no input. Right. Here's the answer I'm looking for. It's smaller than the smallest program which prints the string, plus the description of f. Oh, okay, right. So given yeah. x and the description of f, you can combine those together to print f of x. Then given f of x, you can compute, you can just print f of x, right? What is the size of the program of f as a function of x? Less than x plus c. So every program, f takes no inputs. F, okay. f, 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 f is a program that does something. I'm, I, should have not, I should not be using f here and f here. But f, just, f is constant size. Okay, I see. So these are related again by a constant. I see. So we get the fact that, in, in fact, it depends on what the actual f is, but we get that these are at most um, related by a constant. If f is computable. In fact, if it's not computable, there's even a trick you can do. Uh, I gave this as, as, as a practice problem last time, but to compute k of x to the x k of x, something complicated like this. Very messy, very, very ugly. Oh, I forgot to do my little bit. Um, this is a book. So the Kolmogorov complexity is very simply defined. It is, the, it is the smallest program to print x. That's the definition of k of x. There's this book by uh, Lee and Vitani um, called Introduction to Kolmogorov Complexity's Applications. And this is the second edition of the book. This is the third edition. I just want to mention that all this, this function is very simple. It seems very simple. It's, there's only one thing about it. You could somehow write a book this fat about it. It actually looks much smaller on camera than it is. But it goes up to page 630. There's 630 pages written about it. This third edition is even more. There's an insane amount of material you can study about this one application. You could teach five courses just on this one application. We haven't even scratched the surface about what's possible with this uh, what well, we know about this function. So my goal for today, which I should have said at the beginning, is to just tell you through a huge breadth of what's possible uh, via applications or, or knowledge about this function. Okay. So we've done some. Let's do, we've done some examples. Let's try and see if we can detect. Uh, let's try and talk about the theory of when a string has a short description versus a long description. Right. So every string has a description of its own length. Right. You just describe the string. Hard-coded, fine. But it appears sometimes you can get shorter descriptions if the string has some kind of pattern to it, right? If there is pattern and repetition within the string, perhaps you can define it. You can, you can exploit that pattern to get a shorter description, right? Um, so we say a string is compressible uh, if it's not incompressible. So we say a string is incompressible, uh, is incompressible, if basically, X is incompressible basically if the shortest program to print X is just the hard-coded one. So we'd write that as K of X is greater than or equal to the size of X minus some C. And we could choose C to be whatever, like compressible by three bits or whatever. Like it's, it's C compressible, C incompressible, right? Um, maybe you put a log in there. Right? It doesn't really matter. It's like the shortest, basically the a string is incompressible if the shortest program is just the hard-coded one. We, X of X, so we proved K of X. Right, by hard coding it. We also did k of x of x, and k of x to the n, and then k of f of x to the n, k of f of x, right? f of x. These, pro, these x, x, x versus x. x, x has, although it's twice as long, it has a shorter description than strings relative to its own length. Because it really, the, string, the description of x, x is really just the description of x with a little bit of computation there. So, in some sense, k of x may be hard, but k of x, x, relative to strings of its own length, is easy. This is easier to describe string than a different string of the same length, perhaps. 
So we say X is incompressible uh, if this is true. So how do we can determine if a string is compressible or incompressible by looking at it? We want to be able to weight it basically, like the intuition is if the string is pattern, any pattern, it's compressible. We have an exploitable pa a pattern using computation. We're going to uh, do a small counting argument. So how many strings are compressible uh, by like two bits? And let's fix the size. So how many strings of length n are compressible by two bits? So I give you a string, and here we're making actually some connections to zip files and stuff, right? So of all the strings of length n, the files of length n bytes or whatever, how many of the how many of those strings, how many of those files can you compress such that the files, the zipped file is smaller by only two bits? Okay, and n can n is arbitrary here, but we're compressing it by a constant amount, so n could be a billion. I'm asking you for many gigabyte files, and I'm only asking you for a description that's shorter by two bits. It's nothing. Uh, how many of those files exist? And let's compute this as a ratio. So how many strings of length n are there? Sigma to the n, right? That's the number of strings of length n. How many strings are uh, compressible by two bits? I would write it like this. x is a string of length n. Um, right? So this is a ratio. The top set, using set builder notation, is the set of strings of length n such that the Kolmogorov complexity is less than two, it's two bits less than its length, right? Ignoring constants for now, but it's two bits less than its length, right? What is the, well, if a string is compressible by two bits, that means there exists a program to print the string of uh, length n minus two. If x has length n minus two, then, and x is printable by, a, if x has length n, and x is compressible to n minus 2 or smaller, then, the, then every program which prints x is a program of length n minus 2. So we can upper bound this by all the set of all programs which print n minus 2. So p is a program, and p, the size of p, is less than or equal to n minus 2, right? What is the bottom here? What is the size of the bottom here? Sigma to the n? As a function of n? Yeah, what's the number for this? How many strings of length n are there? Sigma to the n. What if sigma was 0, 1? 0 or 1. Suppose we have a binary. Oh, okay, 2 to the n. Yeah, perfect. So now we're, we have an upper bound on our ratio by the number of programs of length n, uh, this is a huge, greatly liberal upper bound, okay? These are the programs that print uh, strings of length n. These are all programs of length n minus two, right? These are ins insanely, insanely smaller programs. I mean, these are, this is a huge upper bound. There's no way equal, okay? This is not tight. This is much, much greater. Now, how many programs, now each program of length n minus two, what is a program if not a string of length n minus two, right? Every program is itself a string. We're going to take an even greater upper bound and, and union over all the strings of length less than n minus 2, i equals 0 to n minus 2 over 2 to the n. Every program, every string which is compressible by two bits has a program to compress which has length n minus 2, and every program of length n minus 2 is just a string of length n minus 2. What is this top? If we union the strings of length n minus 2, the, you remember the geometric series? This is going to be, sigma i is going to be 2 to the i, right? So this is going to be uh, union of i equals 0 to n minus 2 of 2 to the i over uh, 2 to the n. And this is going to be equal to what? If you union all the strings of length i, none of these intersect, so those join. So it's just going to be the sum of 2 to the i, i equals 0 to n minus 2 over 2 to the n, and do you remember what this is? I think this is 2 to the n minus 1, right? 2 to the n minus 1, over 2 to the n? I think it's like the first term times the first term times uh, to the column ratio minus 1, over the column ratio minus 1. So it's the column ratio is 2. Oh, no, the number of terms. 
Um, it's, um, let me see, a r to the n minus 1 over r minus 1. Yes. So a is just 1, r is 2, n is n minus, zero, n minus 1, minus 1 over 2 minus 1. I think it's 2 to the n minus 1. Correct. 2, two to the n minus 1. Minus 1. 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1? 2 to the n? You put, you're putting a minus 1 here? That doesn't work out, I think. It's got to be it's got to be minus 1 in the exponent. Because this is going to be 1 power. The way I remember it, and I hope I'm not wrong, is this is 1 power greater than this. Right. But is it also, I don't... That, the left one is 1 times 2 times 2. This is going to be the strings of length 0. How many strings of length 0 are 1? Plus the strings of length 2. Plus the strings of length 4. Plus the strings of length 8, right? So it's, it's a... This is half. This is equal to all of this, right? So it's the last term. It's 2 to the n minus 2 plus uh, 2 to the n minus 2 minus 1. Right? Right. So you add the 2 and you get 2 times 2 to the n minus 2. 2 to the... 2 times 2 to the n minus 2 is what? 2 to the n minus 1. Minus 1. So there's a minus 1 there. Right. So there's a minus 1 here and a minus 1 there. Right. Okay. But I'm not sure I understand the step. Um, so that... It, oh, it's the union. I thought it was pi. Okay, yeah, I don't know. I see oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay, now what is this? Let's just forget the minus 1, because now I, I want to ignore it. Right. We get... What is 2 to the n minus 1 over 2 to the n? To the end, uh, it's a half. Okay. Half of the strings of length n are compressible by two bits. Consider all the strings of length n, all files of a million gigabytes or whatever, only half of them have a files that can be compressed by two, bi two, by two bits. Not even a byte. Two bits. That's nothing. Let's generalize this. What happens if we did this by 3 or something, right? What we would get is 2 to the d plus... If we want to compress it by d bytes, we generalize this proof. This would be a d, this would be a d, this would be a d, this would be n to the minus d, n minus d plus 1, and then we would get 2 to the 2 over uh, d. It's probably, it's like 2 to the d, okay? So there's a plus 1 somewhere. Let me see if I... I don't have to work it out, I can just say where it is. 2 to the d minus 1. 2 to the d minus 1. Uh, okay, if d is a byte, if d is 8, then 2 to the 7 is, what, 256? No. Uh, 60, uh, 128. 128. So only 100, 1 over 128 files are compressible by a byte. Oh, wow. So if you have a billion gigabytes and you want to compress it by a megabyte, a kilobyte, it's one of the files, none of the files, are going to be compressible by that much. So in, this, in some sense, what we've really derived here is that most strings are incompressible. Overwhelmingly, most of them do not have short descriptions. For most strings, the, string, the, only, the shortest description of the string possible is going to be the one uh, which is just saying it out loud. And this kind of makes sense in a uniform... So there's two contradictions here. Uh, no matter the contradictions. Two thought ideas. Why does, file why does file compression work in practice? What happens is, like, the files that most people care about are not uniformly random. Most strings are not going to look like you drew a uniformly random one. So this is we're, as if we took a random string of length n, and we tried to guess the probability that we could compress it by two bits. It's a half. Um... Most strings do not look uniformly random. If you were to go right now to some JPEG, whatever, create a uniformly random JPEG, it would look like TV static, right? If you have a picture of, if you have a JPEG picture of a parrot, large blotches of red, the lossy and lossless compressions algorithms take advantage of the pattern existing in these photos. They see the large splotch of red and they compress that, right? They describe that. So although LEMPLZIV and lo JPEG, lossless and lossy, uh, by this kind of argument, have poor, extremely poor, average case complexity for the instances that you want to compress in practice. Most of the time, uh, it's very compressible, 
right? It works in practice. If you have text, words repeat themselves quite often. The E is more frequent than the other letters. Letters don't appear uniform um, at all, right? So here's a, here's a second deep remark, okay? Uh, it's, a, again, a description of randomness. So a random string may be incompressible. Do you know what a pseudo-random generator is? Yeah, it's like uh, any kind of... Um, Anytime you use a computer to generate random numbers, you, you, you generate pseudo-random numbers. Yes. So basically, a pseudo-random generator is a program which is seeded by some very small true randomness called a seed. Maybe it's 128 bits. And right. using that, it can generate arbitrarily long, quote-unquote, pseudo-random numbers, pseudo-random seeds. So it can print out arbitrarily long random strings. Okay? The thing is, a pseudo-random and random are very different uh, from a complexity point of view. If, like, if P is not equal to NP, it's conditional if we can distinguish pseudo-random from random. I give a machine to a random string, a pseudo-random one, it shouldn't be able to tell them apart. And good pseudo-random number generators exist if P is not equal to NP and so on, right? However, every random string may be, uh, may not have a short description, but every pseudo-random string has a short description. What is the short description of a pseudo-random string? Just the description of the pseudo-random generator? Exactly. Plus the seed constant, though. Like, the, the random gener the, the pseudo-random, uh, the Kolmogorov complexity of a pseudo-random string is small. So I've talked all about this. Um, actually, before I go into that part, I'll do one more, one more quick thing. So uh, let's try and plot this function. So I claim the plot, if we were to plot k of x, not as a function from strings to strings, but a function from numbers to numbers, uh, it would look something like this. Right. This is more what I claim it would look like. Um, the first few values, at least, if you could plot it. Uh, why? So there's four facts that I want to issue issue about the uh, the function. First is that k of x uh, grows unbounded. So the longest strings have to be more complex than the shorter ones, even if they are short. If even if the, even if they're simple long strings. A description of the string still has to include the length. So the function is increasing, mostly, right? The function is going up. Uh, two, k of x hugs the log of x, right? If log of x was a number, suppose we were plotting the strings. Why does it hug log of x? We proved most strings are incompressible, and this is log of x, right? Most strings, the shortest program for most strings is going to be the program itself. That, that the hard-coded program with the string in it. So most of the time, it hugs this log of x function, okay? Uh, three, although it hugs log of x, k of x also dips infinitely often. Uh, why is that true? Well, notice that k of x is going to be kind of very close to k of 2x, right? Which is very close to k of x squared which is very close to like uh, k of x plus square root of x, plus, uh, which is very close to like k of like 2 to the x, and so on, right? The complexity of all these strings is basically the information contained in them is just the computable function plus x. The in x is really the meat. The rest of these can be derived from x, right? You can derive x squared from x. You can derive f 2 to the x from x. But these are much more increasing often, right? So this is maybe something that will appear somewhere else. So although it hugs log of x for most of the time, it dips really frequently, all the time. Um, and here's the final one. Uh, this is an integer, integer value function, so we can't really say it. So, but k of x is kind of continuous. So if you recall continuity of, uh, uh, in calculus, you, would, you might write something like 
uh, f of x plus h minus f of x is less than, I don't remember. Oh, it's, it's the f of x plus h minus over h is the limit of x approaches h? I'll put a c here. Okay. Because I forget it. Right. Yes, but there is, a, there is an over h somewhere. But basically what this means is like, if you add a very small perturbance to x, a very small perturbance happens in the function. Right. So like if you have some function here and you move in the x a little bit, you can only move in the y a little bit. You won't right. move too much in the x and the y. The same thing is true though for Kolmogorov complexity. Right. So y, k of x is within a constant of k of x plus or minus 1. Right. This is bounded by some constant. So it doesn't jump everywhere. Like if it did, if this were if this were not true, perhaps the function might look like this, right? Right. Like every next number is is somehow very different than the previous ones. Uh, this kind of implies that it, if we were to plot the graph, it would look kind of continuous. So that's why we're able to draw a nice line, uh, uh, a nice line on the board. Okay. Uh, so we've talked a lot about k of x. We talked a lot about its properties. One thing we haven't talked about at all is how to do it. Like, how do you compute it? So, how would you compute k of x? For any x? Yes. So basically, you're trying to find the shortest description to describe a string. Of every string. You couldn't come up with one way to do it for every string, right? Why not? It's, it's kind of like you're asking for an algorithm that gives an algorithm for something. So maybe I'm not asking for the algorithm. I'm asking a way to compute k of x itself. It returns a number of the length of the shortest program. It finds the shortest program. Maybe it doesn't even find the shortest program. Maybe it just returns the length of that program. Did you do like you did before, where you just say, let g be the function that gives the smallest? Ah, so I've been, I've made you for a fool, I've tricked you. I never described a way to do that. I just said, suppose or you could do it, I never actually described it. I said, let g be a function that prints x, I didn't say how to find g. k of x is algorithmically unsolvable. Unsolvable. Another way to think of this is that the sh set of incompressible strings, telling if a string is incompressible or compressible, is undecidable. You have no idea if a string is compressible or not. Uh, there is no, k of x is undecidable. There was an ancient proof uh, by reduction, but I think there's a very nice, beautiful proof using the recursion theorem. Basically, we're gonna make a program that prints the shortest string longer than its own description, but because the machine prints that string, it has to, it, we, we derive a contradiction. So M on input uh, W, which is going to ignore, uh, via recursion theorem, I'll write this here. Assume to the contrary, first that uh, K of X is computable. Then there is a Turing machine which halts on all inputs to compute k of x. Okay, we'll use that in our in our. If k of x was computable, we can build that into our into our thing. Uh, via recursion theorem, I should be cleaner. Obtain its own code via recursion theorem. for x in sigma star lexicographically. What that means is it's going to print the strings in alphabetical order, or not print them, it's going to search, uh, it's going to do an infinite, it's going to do a for loop over an infinite set. It's going to look for each string. And the order it's going to do this is it's going to be empty set, empty strings, excuse me, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, right? It's going to loop over the infinite set in that order. Um, that's what it means for x in superstructure graphically. If the Kolmogorov complexity of x is greater than the description of the machine, uh, print x. So 
So M prints the shortest string, uh, which is longer than its own description. So uh, M prints X uh, such that uh, the complexity of X is greater than the length than, than the program. Okay? But M prints X. If M prints X, we know that the complexity of the string is, is less than the program. This and this cannot both be true. Right? We derive a contradiction. X uh, M prints the string, which is has complexity greater than its length, but because the machine prints the string, the machine prints the string, that means the complexity is less than the length of that program. Right. Um, we didn't actually need the recursion theorem here, it turns out. There's ways to do it without it. You can kind of like hard code a bigger number here. Like if x has length, if m has length a thousand, put a million here, and it will print a string greater with complexity greater than a million, but the machine prints the string. So the machine also has length less than a thousand or something. The problem is, is like, by inserting and changing that number, you have changed what the uh, size of the program is. Um, so there's a little bit of math you have to do to avoid using the recursion theorem. You can also run the machine on its own encoding, and then instead of the machine, uh, instead of w here, you can just have uh, the size of w. Instead of m here, you get the size of w, and then you run the machine on its own encoding. So that would also work. Uh, but this is another application of the recursion theorem to prove that Kolmogorov complexity all its beauty, all its mysticism, all its applications is not computable. So here we're able to somehow even plot a function. We're able to describe a function and we're able to plot it. Yet, uh, we have no idea, um, uh, we have no idea how to compute it. It's, un it's not computable, algorithmically unsolvable. But yet, we're just from inference and other in relationships between uh, inequalities and other programs, we're able to know at least something about it. I want to end with two applications of uh, Kolmogorov complexity. Just to, so now we've spent the whole time just talking about Kolmogorov complexity. I want to actually apply it. Uh, by app apply it, I mean nothing to do with, uh, as, a, as a foundation for a theory of description, nothing to do with uh, programs or printing. You know what Euclid's theorem is? We talked about Euclid in geometry, but there's a thing called Euclid's theorem that actually has nothing to do with geometry, or apparently nothing to do with geometry. I think I've heard of so many things with Euclid. Is it, is it the one where there's infinite primes? Exactly. That's what I was asking. So I was wondering which one would you think, which one would you guess? Uh, so you may recall Euclid's classic proof that there are infinitely many primes. Yes. Basically, if there are finitely many, assume there are finitely many, and you make a new one, P time one, right? Let me write it out. So, like the, Euclid, the Euclidean proof is like uh, assume that there are finitely many primes p1 to pk, then what is n is equal to p1 uh, times pk uh, plus 1, right? right? It's not divisible by any of the pks, so it, right. um, it has to be itself prime, right? right. Um, it, we're going to use Kolmogorov complexity to prove that there are infinitely many primes. So, suppose, assume to the contrary. Uh, there exist finitely many primes. And we'll call these P1 to the to PM. Okay? Then uh, for all n in, a, in the natural numbers, uh, then there exists uh, E1 to EM in the naturals such that n is equal to the prime power factorization, right? P1, E1, P2, E2, Pm, Evm, right? Do you agree? If there's only finitely many primes, every number has a unique prime factorization, then there exists these powers of the primes that represent every number, okay? But uh, we can describe n in terms of the powers of the primes, right? So E1, to EM is a description of N. Do you agree? 
uh, we're kind of being ambiguous about the program would look like. Suppose I gave you this list, or you hard code this list of numbers, brute force find all the primes again, doesn't matter about the time, uh, then you compute it, and then you can print it. So this is a sufficient description, unique prime factorization, that uh, E1 to EM represents N. So what is the size of each i? So in the worst case, what is the largest ei we can have? Like the worst case would be like n is equal to some uh, like pi to the ei, it's a single value. Um, then we would know that like uh, ei is like uh, the log of base pi of n, do this right? Yeah, so log is kind of like the base pi of n. Okay, in the worst case. But we could just say the pi is two, and then we can say that there's certainly more of them, right? Each, so each, each uh, ei uh, takes how many bits? If you hard code it, it takes log of ei bits. But since they're also much smaller than n, um, And uh, EI is approximately log of n, right? So we know from one way that the complexity of x, excuse me, the complexity of n is less than the encoding size of each EI, right? So this is going to be log of e, EI, E1, plus dot, 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 log, log, log EM, right? Uh, but we also know that each EI uh, upper bounded is like less than log of n, right? So what we get here is that uh, each, we can bound each EI. If each EI is less than log of n, then we know that what, that it takes log log of n bits to describe uh, EI, right? So it takes log log then bits to describe EI. I'm going to make sure I didn't lose myself here. Does this make sense? So first off, each EI takes log EI bits. Fine. But we know each EI is less than log of n. Terrible, huge upper bound, actually. They're much, much smaller. Um, but if it takes, if each EI is less than log n, and it takes log of EI bits to describe uh, EI, then it takes log log n bits to describe EI. Fine. So we can upper bound each log n, log of EI, by log log of n. Okay. These are all the same. There's uh, m of them. So I'm just going to call this m log log n, right? So what's our contradiction here? Right? So we've now just shown that the size of n is less than or equal to m log log of n, right? m is a constant. So this is really O of log log n, right? You choose a big enough number, the number of m is the number of primes. You choose a big enough, if, if there's like 10 primes, you choose a trillion, it doesn't really matter, right? So do you see the contradiction here? So you're saying um, k of n is less than O of log log n? Yes. Um, but k of, 
So log login is much smaller than login. Right. Logarithmically smaller. It's pathetically small. Right. This is too small. That's the contradiction. Most n, uh, for most n, uh, k of n uh, is uh, less than log n, right? By our previous counting argument. Right. So just choose an n that's big enough, and you get it, you get a contradiction. Choose, choose oh, some, I see. right. Choose some right. incompressible n. Right. This is a we basically if there were finitely many primes, that gives us a beautiful and very, in fact, a too short way to describe every number. The, the description is too short. There we have a contradiction. So there can't be finitely many primes. This is enables us a descriptive uh, a way to describe something that's way too short. There are way more connections that I would like to prove. The book uh, talks about how to prove languages are regular using Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, it's also in the notes. Um, there's also like some things about computational learning theory in Kolmogorov complexity because just to give you a huge, just, just to give you uh, like the world's worst argument, it's going to be like uh, k of x in human terms. We described it as what the length of the shortest. program to print x. But what, suppose I replaced all those words with synonyms, and I did the following. I said k of x was actually uh, the size of the simplest uh, description. to approximate a data set x. So instead of a, a string, now it's a data set. Doesn't matter. Instead of printing x, we allow it to make some error. It has to approximate, approximate x. And we're talking about the size of the simplest description to, of, of an object, the description which can approximate x. Pretend it's a data set in an Excel file or whatever, instead of uh, a program to print x. What does this sound like? Don't expect you to get this one. It's a wild, wild card question. What is it? What is the size of the smallest description of a data set sound like? CSV or something. Uh, the word I'm looking for is Occam's razor. You have Occam's razor. Oh yeah, the simplest answer must be the right one. Yes. Right. It's more likely something simple happens than something convoluted right. and complex. Right. Occam's razor. So in some sense. There's a huge number of connections between the Kolmogorov complexity and computational learning theory, right? And it comp you can take all these variants of it, computable variants of it, like you can take uh, one that compu maybe computes x in polynomial time or something. All the variants of it, there are computable variants of it, certainly. In general, it's not computable, but uh, there are very deep connections between computational learning theory and the Kolmogorov complexity of something. Because the easier something it is to describe, um, you know, you can't learn noise, right? So. Right. There's a lot going on here, and you'll, you really need to spend a, a career to, to, to know everything. All right?